thank you. Good evening, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight for our Local Foods College session. My name is Ben Anderson. I'm a Regional Director with University of Minnesota Extension. And I'm joining you tonight from my home and farm in Ottertail County, Minnesota. And we're great, uh, grateful for our attendance tonight and our presenters for, for joining us as well. So just very briefly about the Local Foods College, uh, we are in our seventh year of doing this program. And um, I'll note that all of these sessions, like this one, is being recorded, and we'll, we're going to post it on YouTube later. But you can go back and look at every session that we've had for the past seven years and view those. So it's a great online uh, resource and library that we have for, um, you know, at this point, quite a few topics and great discussions about uh, you know, every sort of local foods college, or sorry, local foods issue you can think of. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, we are also, you know, considering doing more of these um, coming up this winter. Uh, so the, the ones that we're having right now, um, you might have noticed if you've participated in the past that we've just been doing like four or five kind of this fall um, compared to previous years where we had, we had a, a longer lineup. So we might be, uh, our planning committee is going to review that and see if we offer some more um, later this year and in, into the new year. The, uh, all of the, the other thing I'll mention is uh, our, uh, this program is, is kind of put together by a, a big cross section of people from across extension in, in many different program areas uh, and parts of the state. So we have a lot of representatives from our regional sustainable development partnerships. Uh, they're kind of our, our lead program sponsor with us, um, but we have people from our small farms team. We have uh, educators that work on a, a host of issues um, across extensions portfolio that are help us put this together. So here is an overview of our presentation tonight. So we're going to be talking about uh, tips for storing, storing and preserving fall vegetables. And we have Suzanne Dreesen on. She's a, a food safety educator with an extension. Uh, here in Minnesota, and you can see her background there and the, the things that she uh, she works on in, in, in her programming. And we also have Cindy Tong with us. She is um, within Extension and the Department of Horticultural Science. Uh, so she works on a lot of uh, post-harvest topics that you can see there, uh, working directly with farmers on, on, a, on a wide variety of things. So, um, we are going to get started. I'm going to hand it over to Cindy, and she is going to get started with her presentation, and then we'll go to Suzanne. And um, like I said, feel free to type in questions as we're going out, and I'll I'll moderate those, and uh, we'll get back to you. So, Cindy, I'll turn it over to you. Um. So before we start, I want to ask the audience a few questions, and these are all yes or no questions. So the first question is, are most of the crops you're storing just for winter use? Yes or no? So I think what green check mark is yes and red is no. I don't know if Suzanne gets to vote. Or Courtney. <laughs> hey, looks like it's mostly, yes, just for winter. OK, do any of you store for spring? Green text for yes, red X for no. Wow, Margaret wants to store all the way to spring. Okay. Anybody get the voting thing down? And Cecilia wants to go into spring. Diehards, people, great. All right, 
Um, next question. <laughs> um, next question is, I have a cold storage facility. Yes or no? Yeah, Courtney, you don't really count because you're cheating. I just know Courtney from, because um, she wants it to you, so I can see her, right, Courtney? Um, okay. Two people besides Courtney have a podium. How many, uh, okay, so the last question is, I have a root cellar. Yes or no? Okay. Most people don't have red cellars. All right. So um, the presentation I put together is kind of based on a survey that Ben and Anna helped send out to people and um, the responses that I got and people sort of said what they were um, preserving and and a lot of people said they were interested in root cellars. So um, here's another question. I am interested in root cellars, yes or no? All right. So um, most of the people who responded are interested in red cellars. Those people who are not, I'm sorry, you can just kind of zone out when I start talking about red cellars. Um, Suzanne's going to talk about preservation techniques like canning and freezing. So um, I'm just going to talk about raw product. That's what the um, people who work at General Mills call raw product. And this is stuff like apples, beets, cabbage, carrots, parsnips, and turnips, all the good things we like to put into, um, what do you, what do the spins call it? Um, you know, those pasties. So, um, these are some of the products that people want to store into the winter, and this, are, this is the condition that they should be stored at. You're aiming for cold and moist. 32 degrees Fahrenheit and high relative humidity. 32 Fahrenheit is really hard to get. It freezes up uh, refrigeration units, but this is what you're aiming for. So this is an aspirational storage condition, not an absolute. Um, and let's see, Courtney's got Turner. Courtney's got, yeah, that's a great idea, Courtney. So if you want to put your name under whether or not you are interested in these, like the little arrow thingies, that would be great. Can people do that? True, excellent. Nobody wants to store pe oh yes, thank you, Michael. Carrots, yep, apples. Nobody wants to store parsnips or turnips. All these old fashioned vegetables kind of losing their popularity. All right, so at least four of the six on this list, um, people are interested in storing. So you kind of need a root cellar or a cold room to store these commodities. All right, so. Garlic and onions. How many of you have garlic and onions you want to store? Okay, so um, garlic and onions. So the people who, a lot of the garlic growers in the state do not believe me, but I have the data to show that if you want to store your garlic for a long time, 
you're going to try to aspire for 32 degrees Fahrenheit. It's close to freezing. But you want it drier than what you're going to store your apples and carrots and beets at. So this makes sense, right? You, you do these garlic and onion bulbs, and you put them through this curing process so that the outer layers were kind of flaky and, you know, nice and flaky, I guess is the word, um, like a croissant. Um, so you don't want those to get wet because otherwise they could rot. So, and then they're going to sprout. But really, if you, if you're not saving them for seed garlic, then you want to store it close to 32. If you want to save them for seed, except why would you do that? Because you're going to plant them now for seed if you're planting garlic. Um, but seed garlic, you can store at a warmer temperature, maybe 40 degrees, 45, 50, somewhere in there. Um, but garlic, you're going to eat. You want to store it at close to 32 degrees to keep it from sprouting. Okay. Um, other people in previous surveys said they are interested in storing pumpkins in winter squash. Audience members, are you interested in storing pumpkins in winter squash? Um, green pets for yes. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, so pumpkins and winter squash. Um, are kind of difficult uh, because you want about 50 degrees Fahrenheit and relatively dry, but not too dry. Um, and I have to say, for winter squash, how well you can store these varieties depends on, on sorry, how well the winter squash stores depends on varieties. So like acorn squash doesn't store as long as um, Hubbard for instance. So um, you just kind of have to expect maybe acorns to last for two, three months, but hubbards can last for even longer. Um, pumpkins, uh, not so, they don't last too long. And actually, a lot of pumpkin growers have a hard time getting them to last till Halloween, it's always a big race because the pumpkins are ready first week of October and they want them to last till the end of October and then it's snowing and freezing outside and um, it's not easy. So if you can't do it, don't feel bad. Um, move to Hubbard's squash instead. Even though, yeah, I don't, I don't eat Hubbard squash. Um, maybe buttercups or something like that. They store fairly well. All right. So I'm going to move. Cindy, really quick. Um, yeah. Linda had a comment about parsnips. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on it. She said, we keep parsnips by keeping them in the garden all winter and then harvest them when the ground thaws. They are the first harvest of the spring. Huh. Um, okay. So, I haven't heard of people doing that. I've heard of people putting them in stands in the root cellars, but I haven't heard of them leaving it in the ground all winter. If it works for you, Linda, that's great. Um, I would expect they would maybe last as long as there's no freeze thaw, freeze thaw thing going on during the winter time. Um, if it's just frozen, and basically that's like putting it in your freezer and then trying to get them out before they really thaw, thaw, and turn kind of rubbery. Does that work, Linda? You know, to see it's fat. Um, so does anybody, has anybody else tried this, leaving roots in the ground all winter? Green cat for yes, X, red X for no. 
Linda says they taste sweeter when uh, taking this approach. Oh, yeah, Michael has also tried this before. Michael, do you want to weigh in on this? Linda also says the only problem they've faced is the occasional loss due to mice. <laughs> so sorry, rodents. <laughs> So like Cindy said, if anyone else has uh, comments on this topic or throughout the presentation, just feel free to use the chat feature on the, the bottom right. Uh, Beth said that red curry, if I'm pronouncing that right, squash store as well. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, she, grows in, she grows it in Duluth and stores it in her basement after cleaning the skin well. Yeah, that's great. Is that basement not heated? Anybody? Okay. Um, I'm going to keep going. You guys, that's great. I love it when you make comments in the chat box because we all learn from each other. Um, so please keep doing that. But I'm going to keep going on my presentation so that you all get Suzanne for however long you need Suzanne. Um, so if you want to store these crops, you got two options. One is building a cold storage facility, um, and the other one is building a root cellar. And the picture that's on the screen is a cold storage facility that somebody built in their garage. Um, so it's basically a box that's insulated. You see there's that pink insulation. Um, and then it's um, kept cold using an air conditioner hooked up to a cool bot. And that cool bot is that little device at the top right of the screen. And it brings the temperature down close to the 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And so if your cold room is not super big, it's basically like a walk-in closet, um, then this works really well. Um, but you do need electricity, which can be an added cost. Um, and so a lot of people like to build root cellars because, you know, you can save a little on electricity or using the earth to kind of moderate the temperatures and keep the, your stuff cool. And these are just a, pic, a few pictures and diagrams of root cellars. So, so they're built, these are built into a hill. Um, there's a door, obviously, so you can get into them. But the most important thing about a root cellar is, is that you have to have air circulation. And, and this is for Minnesota because you don't want things to get too cold and you don't want them to get too warm and, and you don't want gases like ethylene gas to build up. And what happens is ethylene gas can hasten the aging of your produce. So you need some kind of ventilation staff or something in there. So um, the best thing to do, and this diagram, there's a, this diagram is from a book called Root Cellaring by Mike and Nancy Bubel. So if you're interested in building a root cellar, this is a great reference. Um, lots of people have used this diagram in lots of different presentations and thought, hey, why not? I'm using it too. So basically, I'm just using it to tell you that air circulation is very important. And what you want is cold air coming in, but going to the floor of your root cellar and warm air going out. So these little hatch mark things are cells where you can put your baskets or tubs or produce and um, you also want to have those baskets and tubs 
have air holes so that you can get air circulation um, through the produce, not, you know, hit a solid box or something. So um, this diagram is from that book, and it's great. It, it shows what you need to do for ventilation. And um, this is another diagram of a cold, a root cellar, basically, in a basement. Um, and the pipes, I'm bring, so there's a long pipe that brings in cold air from the outside and funnels it to the bottom near the floor. And then this pipe at the top of the window is just letting out um, warm air. So there's circulation thing. It doesn't show a fan, but a fan would be a good idea because how else are you going to get air circulation? Huh? So um, putting a fan down at the bottom of the floor and trying to get movement through this space is a good idea. If I'm not making any sense, um, please ask questions. Uh, or if I'm not covering stuff that you want to know about, please ask questions because I can't read anybody's mind, um, especially not my husband. Okay, so here's some notes about a root cellar. You want the exhaust pipe edge to be flush to the wall to prevent condensation. Um, so you don't really want this pipe, the pipe that's coming in to be too much out of the window. Um, and you want to add mesh filter at both ends of the tube so that little mice, um, little rodents don't come in. You want to have a valve um, to open and close. That's a good idea because sometimes, you know, the weather gets warmer than you want, um, especially as we're going into the winter. So this time of year, temperatures kind of fluctuate, and so it's nice to have valves. Um, you want to provide humidity, so you have to either use a humidifier, which works if you have a small space, or what a lot of people do is they just kind of wet the floor and be very careful not to slip on that wet floor. Um, so if you have a humidifier, you also might want a dehumidifier if all you're storing is garlic and onions. If you have a mix like apples and garlic and onions, then you kind of have to figure out where the humidity levels are different in your root cellar and where the best place is for putting the apples versus the onions and garlic. And then sometimes you might not have to put in heat. Um, so if you really are into building root cellars, Michigan State University has this PDF. Um, this is written by engineers who were asked to develop a root cellar for the student farm at Michigan State. Um, but the end conclusion is really that you want your insulation to be four inches and polystyrene works really well. Um, and then you want an, another, you know, four inches of extruded polystyrene and three and a half inches of the other kind of harder styrene. <clears throat> so you can get a really high R value, insulation value, um, and that you need to have something to prevent um, any kind of a vapor barrier so that you, your walls don't rot. And you also want to maybe insulate the floor if you don't have a lot of gravel on it. Um, so if you're interested in reading this PDF, the, the URL is at the top of this slide. Um, let's see. So if you don't have a lot of things to store, 
you know, you could just dig a pit in your greenhouse and bury garbage cans containing your vegetables. I've seen root cellars where people have just buried vegetables in sand and wet the sand periodically. It doesn't work really well if you have a lot of produce to store because um, then you get sand all over the place and that kind of stuff. But, you know, it, it can work. Um, if you just have a finished basement, then you can store things in a corner of that basement that if you don't have a lot to store, in the corner of that basement away from the heat source. Um, Carl Rosen, who works on potatoes and is a big garlic grower, does this for his potatoes. He just stores his potatoes in a corner of his basement, the finished basement. And he says he can store his potatoes through the beginning of spring. And they might start sprouting at that point, but he can pretty much um, keep the potatoes. And he grows a lot of potatoes. So does anybody have any questions that they want to put in the chat box? Just to follow up to your earlier question, Cindy, about uh, the temperature of Beth's basement for her squash in Duluth, she said that she heats her basement to 55 degrees. Oh, uh-huh. That should work for winter squash. Does that work really then, well for Beth? We'll see if she adds anything else uh, while we're waiting for that. Um, Michael had a, a comment about um, uh, leaving uh, carrots in the ground of a raised bed uh, through the winter. He covers it with 12 inches of shredded leaves and then he harvests them in the spring and they're just fine. Oh, great. Yeah, I should try that. Like, for me, I have a cold room so I can pee. <laughs> and then Michael had another comment uh, after you showed that photo of the, um, the cold room in the garage. He suggested um, to not leave, yep, that one right there, not leave the foam insulation exposed because it's a fire. Oh, yeah, no, that problem. picture is just um, the cold room being built in progress. Yeah, um, thank just you to show for it. that comment. Yeah, um, sure. you know, the farmer did not see that exposed, but thank you for that comment. Okay, um, it's 6.33, so if there aren't any more great comments, or bad comments, uh, they all, they've all been good. Um, I'll pass the ball to Suzanne. Thanks, Cindy. And while you're doing that, I'll just mention again that we can uh, we can take some time uh, at the end for any other questions as well for, for either Suzanne or Cindy. And Suzanne, we'll turn it over to you. All right, great. Thanks, Cindy. That's a great presentation. And if you're interested and not um, want to preserve that harvest we'll talk that's what we'll talk about next so uh, food preservation is really about being able to use that produce later even up to a year or two so tonight I'm going to talk about um, how to freeze dry pickle ferment and can fall vegetables again the goal of preserving food is to make sure that it's a safe product and it's also a good product as well too so if you wouldn't mind, would you please answer this question? Yes um, for, or green for yes and X for no. Have you preserved any vegetables this year? Have you preserved any vegetables this year? Looks like we have 11 yeses, and 12 yeses, and two noes. All right. So a lot of times I get questions about the nutritional value of preserved produce. So you can see by the chart and anytime we harvest a 
vegetables, we are going to lose um, some nutrition value within a few days if we uh, don't do something with those. And even under refrigeration, we lose uh, um, half of the vitamins in um, one to two weeks. So if we actually preserve our vegetables shortly after we harvest them, we can they can actually um, retain more nutrition than something in the refrigerator for a few weeks. So as you see in this chart, we're getting most nutritional value from freezing and uh, drying our produce. There's also a renewed interest in, in fermenting products too, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, for a fully fermented product um, does provide um, some nice nutritional value for our our gut, and um, but if we do um, can that product, um, that does um, stop that as well too. So we'll talk about how you can preserve that fermented food without um, canning it. And how long do does a preserved food last? Well, it depends on how you store it, but uh, canned products will last 12 to 18 months. It's best to store um, home canned products in a dark um, shelf uh, with a cupboard or in a cupboard like you see in the picture. That's mine there, and in a away from heat, and then like around 70 degrees. Heat and light are really um, detrimental to home canned or um, cupboard products. Frozen foods will last about 8 to 12 months and dried again, um, the cooler they are, the longer they'll last. A year at 60 degrees, uh, that gets reduced if the temperature is at 80 degrees to 6 months. And fermented products, you can keep those in your refrigerator for 2 to 3 months. Uh, you can freeze it, uh, lasting 8 to 12 months, or you can can that fermented product like sauerkraut, and that'll last uh, up to 18 months. So freezing works really well for carrots, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, um, and cauliflower. It'll work well for potatoes that are cooked. Um, if you freeze potatoes from a raw state, it uh, will the starch will separate and it gets really liquidy. So it's best if you prepare those like with front, um, via French fries or mashed potatoes, and then also cabbage will freeze. Um, okay if you're going to use that in a cooked dish. Before you freeze vegetables, you want to control the enzymes, and you can do that by blanching in um, boiling water or steam. When we, so enzymes are natural proteins that help ripen our vegetables, and as when we harvest that continues, so we want to halt that enzyme production because if we don't, that makes our end product um, tough and rubbery and also dries it out. And so we can blanch our vegetables using boiling water or steam. And as you'll see that um, when you look at blanching times, that um, via steam will be about a, um, one and a half times that of water blanching, but it's a, a very easy process to do, and it's again a quality, not a food safety issue. If you choose not to blanch your vegetables before you freeze them, um, just know that your shelf life um, is shorter um, to two to three months, be, and after that. Uh, you'll develop some off flavors in your vegetables and they won't be taste very well. So again, preserving is about quality and food safety. So blanching times will vary depending on the product that you're freezing and how you are blanching it. Again, um, blanching and steam will take longer. And on our University of Minnesota Extension website, uh, we do have a chart with the other vegetables that you may be interested in blanching. 
after you blanch your vegetables, then you want to cool them immediately in ice water or in cold water, at least 60 degrees, to stop the cooking process. And then you want to drain the vegetables uh, really well to prevent ice crystals, which will uh, dry out your product and um, cause fr um, freezer burn. So what I like to do is I <laughs> grab a big bath towel, clean bath towel, and um, put my vegetables after um, they're cooled on that and dry them really well. A salad spinner works great too. And then when you pack your vegetables for freezing, you can um, just take them from your salad spinner and put them in your containers and press out the air and seal. That's um, what will happen though, they'll clump together and you'll get a solid pack. Or if you'd rather have a loose pack where they don't all stick together and you can pour, pour them out, you can that's called a loose pack and you put, um, before you freeze the whole product, you put it on a, a tray and then put it in the freezer, wait for about 30 minutes, take it out and then um, pack them into your freezer bags. So a few freezing tips. You want to make sure that you can um, freeze food quickly. It should freeze solid within 24 hours. Um, because again, if you freeze, if the food freeze slowly, you're going to end up with more ice crystals and more uh, freezer burn, which causes flavor changes and um, food to be rubbery. So 24 hours before um, you start your freezing process, um, turn your freezer down to minus 10 degrees. Um, and then when you do freeze your food, um, spread out the packages throughout your um, freezer, and then you can stack them when they're, fro when they're frozen. Uh, maintain your freezer at zero degrees or colder, and then um, try to keep your freezer three-fourths full um, so when you open it, the hot air doesn't um, heat, heat up your freezer. And so what I do at home is I'll add um, containers of um, water, and gallon jugs of water if, if the freezer's not full. So we'll move on to drying, and if you want to use that little air arrow um, of some foods that you might be interested in, in drying, you could do that. Um, drying, so drying, dr how drying works is that it pulls out the moisture in our, in our vegetable so that microbes can't grow and they can't mold, and it also creates a nice, um, hard outer layer too so that um, bacteria can't get inside the food. So we've got some peppers and tomatoes, awesome. My favorite um, way to preserve tomatoes, especially cherry tomatoes, is um, dehydrating them. Before I um, start my dehydrator, I sprinkle them with Italian seasoning and they're just a, a nummy snack. So we've got some peppers. Peppers work, work really well too. Excellent. All right, so there's um, different ways that you can dry food. A uh, food dehydrator you know, works really well because it um, has a fan and can dry out the product really quickly. Um, in the, so a question for you, um, check the green X or the green check mark um, or, or X if you have an access to uh, to a food dehydrator. Do you have access to a food dehydrator? And if you do have a food dehydrator, make sure that you're following your manual on um, drying times and whether you need to blanch that product, a uh, vegetable first. I know my dehydrator book, it tells me that I need to use at least three trays. And um, even if they're empty, I have to stack at least three trays for it to work properly. And I also um, have to um, switch my trays, rotate my trays every hour. So it looks like people, let's see, we have eight people that have a dehydrator in five, no. So indoor air drying works well um, too for herbs, peppers, um, nuts in a shell. And so if you want to preserve herbs and, and um, 
peppers, you tie those together and it'll take about, in bundles, it'll take about two to three weeks to dry. And um, for nuts, it, you spread those on a, a paper, newspaper, and that's gonna take a little longer. It'll take about four to five weeks to dry. And you'll know the dry, they're dried when the membrane is um, kind of papery. So the um, other way people will um, dry is, again, on, on the vine. I, you'll see there I have some coriander that I um, dried on the vine. I also do that sometimes with my um, yellow or green beans and let them um, shell out, and then I harvest those as well, too. But um, there is a chance that there may be some insect, insect eggs, so we want to destroy those and we'll freeze those for 48 hours or we can put those in an, an, an oven at 175 degrees for 15 minutes um, or 160 degrees for 30 minutes. So I have a question for you. Um, is this new information? Did you know that you should pasteurize air or vine dried products before using them? Um, green check mark for yes and X for no. So we've got some eight no's and four yeses, so great trying to share some things with you tonight that you may or may not know. So oven drying is another great way to um, dry vegetables, but know that it's going to take two times longer than a food dehydrator. And you, the temperature is usually 140 degrees. Not all ovens will go that low. Usually um, keep warm is um, 140 degree setting. You do not want to um, have a temperature higher than 200 degrees because that will actually uh, cook your product and actually can scorch your vegetable as well too. Um, some tips for you if your oven drying is um, if you have a convection, turn that on. Um, if not, you um, put a fan outside um, of the oven and make sure that you're propping the oven door open two to six inches. Again, you need that air circulation and that flow of, of air in and out. And the other thing is try to keep um, your trays three to four inches away from the inside, um, the sides of your oven, again, for that circulation. And if you're going to stack and use um, more than one rack, have two to three inches um, between your racks. And then before drying, um, again, to destroy or halt that enzyme, um, blanch those vegetables be, um, using water or steam. Now some vegetables you can um, dry without blanching. I do not dry my tomatoes and they turn out, I do not blanch my tomatoes and they turn out just fine. Um, onions and eggplant, you do not have to um, blanch before drying. Uh, they will get a little dark, but that's a quality issue, not a food safety issue. And then vegetables will be dry when they um, become brittle and break. Then you know they're done. And you want to store dried foods in airtight containers so that moisture from the air doesn't rehydrate those. And um, also um, airtight containers, if there's any air um, and they're not dried right, they will mold. Um, Again, we talked about this earlier, but the cooler the better. And in fact, I take a lot of my um, dried products and put them in freezer bags and then freeze them. So we'll talk a little bit um, about fermentation because it's getting popular. And last night, I actually dreamt about fermenting, <laughs> making sauerkraut in my dream. I actually taught a class a few weeks ago, so that was that was kind of fun to do that in my dream. But <laughs> I just want to talk about uh, cabbage a little bit because um, canning cabbage is not recommended. Um, it will discolor and really have a strong, unpleasant flavor, so you probably won't eat it if you do can it. Um, freezing is an option, 
but turning cabbage into sauerkraut is really a great way to preserve if you have a, a good supply of it, or even if you don't have a big supply of it. A lot of people are um, actually fermenting in um, quart canning jars, which works really well too. But the best sauerkraut is made from cabbage harvested in the late fall, and as they contain more sugars that support growth of lactic acid, which is needed for the fermentation process. So if you're interested in making sauerkraut, you can, um, which, what's nice about fermenting is that you can actually flavor away and you can add different vegetables to it and you can really kind of play around with it um, versus canning. You have to follow the rules and the recipe exactly. Where fermenting, fermentation, you can play around a little bit with it. Um, just a couple tips, and this would fall true for other vegetables too that you ferment. Um, of course, you want to start, um, if you're using cabbage, you want to make sure you take those outside leaves off because they can contain spoilage microorganisms that can, um, you know, again interfere with the process and add microbes into your um, into your your kraut. So you want to rinse, but don't scrub it again. If you scrub your cabbage, you can actually remove the lactobacillus bacteria that you need to get the fermentation process going. You want to make sure that you're shredding into one eighth, one eighth inch grips. Um, and then so anything that's bigger than that, pull that out and use it for something else. Uh, it's based on weight, so making sure that once it's shredded that you're weighing it and then you're salting it. Uh, for sauerkraut, um, you will do use three tablespoons of pure salt, um, salt without any uh, additives is needed. Um, otherwise, it'll in interrupt the, the fermentation process. So it's three tablespoons of salt per five pounds of cabbage. And then once you salt it, make sure you just let it stand for 15 to 30 minutes to get that wilt, and it'll start producing its own ju own juices. And then when you're making sauerkraut, uh, get in there and work it. You know, twist it, use a, a kraut pounder or whatever. But you're really trying to work to or to work it, start that um, process, and uh, get the have it make its own juice. And then packing it tightly because it has to be in an airtight environment under the brine. So you want to again um, use something that can really pack it down into your vessel really tightly. And then you're going to cover um, with um, brine so you can make your make additional brine. Or um, like when we did it in the class, we had enough of its own brine. We didn't need to make any extra brine. And then you're going to weight it down. A lot of people will weigh it down with uh, fill out a, fill up a plastic freezer bag with um, extra brine and that will weigh it down and then when you store it make sure that you also cover it with a dark towel so that you prevent um, um, light because light will kill your ferment and also um, you want to protect it so that um, insects and things like that don't get into your into your sauerkraut. Um, the best flavor um, of kraut will happen at 70 to 75 degrees. It'll take about three to four weeks to ferment. If you're doing the quart jars or the smaller, that'll ferment in about a week. So you can pickle or relish it if uh, you're not sure what else to do, but Basically, when we're pickling a product, we're taking a low acid food, like these um, jalapeno peppers, for example. We're adding vinegar to change it to an acidic food where we can then safely um, can it using a water bath can canner. Um, there is a rummage relish recipe on the National Center for Home Food Preservation website that uh, is great to use some of those end of the season vegetables. It's got green and red tomatoes, cabbage, onions, celery, peppers, cucumbers, vinegar, and spices. Um, so it's only for pint jars and then you process that for 20 minutes. So processing um, after you fill your jars, really, jars is really important when you're pickling, and um, that's to destroy any acid tolerant uh, bacteria, and it's also going to um, get a really nice tight seal for you too. So we'll move on to canning. 
And so uh, how canning works to preserve food is that uh, you put food in, in a jar with a lid and then you heat it to temperatures that will destroy microorganisms and, and you activate those enzymes we talked about and create a nice and tight seal to make it shelf stable. So beets, carrots, turnips, rutabagas um, are all really great and suitable vegetables for home canning, but unless we pickle them, we do need to process those in a pressure canner. And here's why. <laughs> um, so home canned um, beets, home canned green beans, um, home canned um, potatoes that were processed in using a water bath method, not a pressure canner, um, have caused uh, incidents um, and illness of botulism. And botulism is really a serious disease and um, can be life-threatening. It is 100% preventable when we come to canning by choosing the correct um, processing method. So prevent botulism by choosing the correct processing method. And this is based on the acidity level of the food. So if it's a high acid food, like um, a fruit, or if we sauerkraut would be high acid, or uh, something we pickle. Um, so the clostridium botulinum spores, will um, they're everywhere in our environment, but they um, will only grow in an airtight environment that we create. Um, that we create by canning it, but it will only grow if we don't process it correctly and in the right food. So in high acid foods, they won't grow, um, and that, that high acid is a acidity level of um, 4.6 or below, and so uh, if we have that acidity level, we can safely um, use the boiling water method. If we have low acid foods like our vegetables, um, meat, poultry, or if we mix things together like a spaghetti and meat sauce, for example, um, soups, those would all are low acid foods uh, above 4.6. And so to kill that Clostridium botulinum spore, we have to heat it long enough at a temperature of 240 degrees and we can only get that temperature um, in a pressure canner. So I just want to uh, talk just briefly and we'll finish out about um, pumpkins, squash, pumpkins, um, and also potatoes regarding um, canning. So pumpkin squash, um, if we're going to puree it, make pumpkin butter or pumpkin preserves, and this is also for squash too, um, then we have to freeze that. We can't um, can that safely, even using a pressure canner, because it's too thick that the heat won't penetrate to the middle, and um, Clostridium botulinum spores can actually um, not be destroyed and live and cause um, a botulism outbreak. And so that's true too, like with, um, so it has to be um, cubed and it has to be a, uh, a squash that's not stringy. So like spaghetti squash, uh, for example, is not appropriate to freeze or to can. Um, an option would be to freeze or dry spaghetti squash. Now, um, the other thing is with potatoes too. If we can potatoes, they should be cubed. They shouldn't be smashed. Um, again, it's about that heat penetration to make sure that it gets um, that it's cubed and not not um, smashed together. Um, you can can onions, but there's no research for canning garlic um, in a pressure canner, even though you will find it on on the internet. And so altitude and canning is important too. Um, water boils one degree lower for every 550 feet above um, sea level, so our highest altitude is 2,000 feet. So make sure that you're choosing your processing time and methods for 1,001 to 2,000 feet. Um, I know there are spots in Minnesota that are below 1,000 feet, so you can use processing times um, if you're below 1,000 feet, um, and you can find that out easily. 
So you can reduce your risk um, by safety first to make sure that you're using science-based tested recipes, um, 1994 or newer, and then making sure that you're not altering those canning recipes. There's also a lot of great resources out there that are research tested and will um, eliminate your food safety worries. If you're on the internet Googling things, make sure that they reference um, a university, like an EDU, um, be a good cue that they're coming from a from a resource a research base. Now we do have a extension answer line that can actually talk you through and help you out with uh, your food preservation questions as well too, and you can call them or uh, email them as well. And if you want to learn more uh, on our University of Minnesota Extension website, we have a preserving and preparing page that we offer a lot of resources for you, um, processing times, methods, questions, answers. And then we also have these um, mini modules on 20 different topics. Um, so you can just watch a five minute little mini module to learn more. All right, that's what I have for you today. Thank you, Suzanne. So if there's any uh, questions as we're ending the session, please type those into the chat right now. Um, like Suzanne said, we've got a lot of online resources. And uh, feel free to, um, if you want, you can look up their contact info on our staff directory. And you can contact them with uh, further questions that you might have as well. Uh, please also check out our website for more information on the program. So I'm not seeing any questions coming in. I'm just getting a thank you from Linda to everybody. So we will sign off. And thank you again to everyone for joining us. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Cindy. And thank you, Anna, for your help as well. A uh, reminder to check the evaluation and fill that out. Have a good night. Good night, everybody. Thanks for attending.